Stanford University.
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Good morning, everyone. Today, we take a moment in the, in the spirit of acknowledgement and reconciliation to recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of Stanford has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the founding of this institution in 1885. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples and to the original stewards of this land. Thank you. You may be seated. I greet you with peace, and I welcome you to the 2019 Stanford University Baccalaureate Service. That's right. Congratulations, class of 2019. You've done it. Today, today we gather in celebration to mark the end of one journey and the beginning of another. Here at Stanford, baccalaureate is a multi-faith experience, drawing from diverse wisdom traditions in poetry, song, and prayer. Planned and led by members of the class, it is a time to be together in a more personal way, to pause, to breathe in the midst of a hectic and momentous weekend. It's an opportunity to reflect on our journey through Stanford. Through this time together, may you call to mind all of the twists and the turns of your travels here at Stanford. As you reflect on your journey, be careful this morning not to wander too far down the path of your next adventure. 
there surely will be time enough to plan next steps. But right here, right now, we are called to still that anxious voice that asks, what next? Students, have you heard that one yet? We're going to put that voice away. We're going to put that voice away for the moment. And instead, I'm going to invite you students and family and friends to sit with the complex stir of emotions of this particular moment. All of the joy, a little bit of the anxiety, and even some sorrow this morning. This year, we are honored to welcome activist, entrepreneur, and Olympic medalist Iftihaj Muhammad as our baccalaureate speaker. Muhammad's participation in the Olympics provided her a platform to give voice to diverse communities and encourage resiliency in the face of challenge. At the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Games, Mohammed became the first Muslim to wear a hijab while competing for the United States and won a bronze medal with the women's saber team. She graduated from Duke University with a dual major in international relations and African and African American studies. And in 2016, was named one of Time's 100 most influential people. As an Olympic athlete, Mohammed has competed at the highest levels in fencing, a sport that focuses on the individual. But away from sports, she has turned a spotlight on communities, in particular, often underrepresented and marginalized communities. She invites us all to consider what it means to be part of a multicultural and multi-faith world and points us toward a vision of America that respects all its citizens. Her work on and off the strip has been filled with some struggle, yet she has met each challenge with compassionate courage and fierce vulnerability, modeling the best of who we long to be. Our student speaker, Eden Armas, was Give it up for Eden. Eden was raised in a suburban town of Roselle, Illinois, alongside three siblings and a pair of adorable goats. He is a human biology major and has been involved in the Spoken Word Collective, where he was a finalist in the College Union's Poetry Slam Invitational. When asked why he chose to speak at this event, he said, Baccalaureate reminds us that this is not a time for us to celebrate an achievement, so much as it is a time for us to reflect upon a process. For him, this journey has been healing, reconstructive, and humbling. So here we are in this moment through days that seemed endless and years that passed with a blink of an eye, we have arrived to this very moment. Tomorrow at this time, graduation will be underway and the true commencement will begin. In this brief liminal space nestled between the past and the future, let us pause. Students, I invite you to Take a moment to look around. We practiced this. Go ahead. I, I, gave, I told you we were going to do this. Backwards, forwards, side to side. Family and friends, make sure you look back to them. Can you see your family and friends? If you need to stand up, stand up so you can see them. Wave. They took this journey with you too. Do you see your students? Friends, look around. Look around at this beautiful, beloved community. If any one of you has ever wondered what makes Stanford so very special, now you know. Look around. 
Look around. Go ahead one last time, sideways, forwards, back and forward. What makes Stanford so very special? It's you. It's you and you and you and you and you and all of you, all of you, we all are Stanford together. We are Stanford together. And so in years to come when life is hard, I want you to remember this moment. I want you to remember your community. I want you to remember your family. I want you to remember your friends. I want you to remember who you are and who we are. Together, together, we are Stanford. As we look around, we are mindful that some who began this journey with us are no longer here. We pause in the midst of our celebrations to remember the fragility of life and to honor the memories of all the students who died during this academic year. The flowers on the dais are in their memory. Please join me in a moment of silence as we give thanks for all the ways they enriched this community and our lives. Let us remember and honor them always. Remember by Joy Harjo of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Remember the sky that you were born under Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people, and all people are you. Remember you are the universe, and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is, remember. All that we have been, all that we are yet to become, by Leslie Ahuva Fails. All that we have been separately, and all that we will become together is stretched out before and behind us, like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked, 
together like tandem skydivers, working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear, of fa our fear of failure? Our mistrust of our own talents? What have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit? The lie that we are alone? What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment our feet, our wheels, however we move our bodies across this precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? Blessed are you, spirit of life, who has sustained us, enlivened us, and enabled us to reach this moment. Give us courage in our leaping and gratitude in our landing, and share with us in the joy of a long and fruitful journey together. Sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty of the world through my own eyes. I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty. things that made me feel so wonderful when I was young. I think on the things that made me laugh, made me dance, made me sing. I think on the things that made me grow into a being full of pride. I think on me. See the beauty. 
For Those Who Have Far to Travel by Jan Richardson. If you could see the journey whole, you might never undertake it, might never dare the first step that propels you from the place you have known toward the place you know not. Call it one of the mercies of the road, that we see it only by stages as it opens before us, as it comes into our keeping, step by single step. There is nothing for it but to go. And by our going, take the vow that the pilgrim takes, to be faithful to the next step, to rely on more than the map, to heed the signposts of intuition and dream to follow the star that only you will recognize, to keep an open eye for the wonders that attend the path, to press on beyond distractions, beyond fatigue, beyond what would tempt you from the way. There are vows that only you will know, the secret promises for your particular path and the new ones you will need to make when the road is revealed by turns you could not have foreseen. Keep them, break them, make them again. Each promise becomes part of the path. Each choice creates the road that will take you to the place where at last you will kneel to offer the gift most needed, the gift that only you can give before turning to go home by another way. Hello. Before I begin, I'm going to go a little off the cuff. Huge congratulations, Stanford class of 2019. Please give yourselves the biggest round of applause. That was truly beautiful, um, the Stanford talisman. Um, I want to take this moment to acknowledge the people that have lost their lives this year, uh, including my oldest sister who passed away last week. Um, her name was Brandilyn, and um, this moment has taught me so much about um, loving yourself, loving others, but really doing what you can uh, with your time here on Earth. So I wanted to take a moment to remember her. I am so honored to be sharing this day with you all and I want to say how moving this ceremony has been and how grateful I am to be included with all the other, other wonderful contributors. I remember 12 years ago, oh my God, 12 years, <laughs> when I graduated from Duke, it was really warm outside, early signs of muggy, sticky North Carolina summer. I had double majored in international relations and African studies, I had developed a support system of friends, academic mentors, as well as an environment where I had been able to advance my skills as a fencer. I had established the core upon which I would build my adult life, but I was aware that I was leaving behind a community in which had not without problems thrived. I returned to my hometown, Maplewood, New Jersey, a diverse middle-class suburb about a half hour from New York City. This is the place where I had learned to rely on a support system outside of myself, but also that in, that in the end taught me that in order to succeed, and to succeed in sports means to rise higher and do better than your opponents, it was up to me to do the work. But now, even though I was in my home environment and back with my close family, I was stymied. I wasn't able to find a challenging job and I was considering law school. At this point, it may sound like a very typical college graduate story at Lucens, worried about the future, but I was far from a typical college graduate. When I interviewed for jobs in New York City, it was very clear that the people I spoke with were not used to sitting across from an African-American woman in hijab. I'd been aware of the other ever since I was a girl. And my family and I had found ways to work within and around the systems and keep rising. 
I wasn't naive, and I wasn't a child any longer. From that point on, much happened, some of it very difficult, some of it amazing. I won't go into the chronology of all that transpired. I spent a year writing a book about it, so if you're really interested in the play-by-play, -play, you can find it there. The short version is that, after a brief period of unsatisfying part-time employment and half-baked plans for law school, I found myself determined to pick up my saber again and become the first woman of color on the U.S. national fencing team. I not only managed that unlikely feat, but I went on to the Olympics, won an Olympic medal, started my own successful business, and became an advocate for the advancement of women and girls in sports. Thanks. <laughs> But while I won't dwell on the details, I do want to frame my experience from my commencement to your commencement by focusing on three aspects of the journey. The role of teachers and mentors, the power of discipline and resilience, and the importance of faith and community. So first, teachers and mentors. For those of you who are leaving Stanford today and not planning to move on to graduate school, may be under the impression that you're also saying goodbye to teachers. Finally, you have all of the answers, and your days of being instructed to are happily over. Actually, I'm pretty sure most of you know that is not the case. I've always held teachers, and for me, that term includes coaches and trainers in the highest regard. And from an early age, I had looked up to them and was eager to grasp all of the knowledge I could. That was fortunate for me because I knew that embarking on this new journey meant I had so much to learn. It's hard to describe the knowledge and experience gap that lay before me. Essentially, most Olympic athletes who have a dream of an Olympic team in my sport have already made cadet and junior teams. And at, that, and at the very least, they've competed in senior competitions. I had done neither. I had no domestic or world ranking, but I had two things, faith and a crazy work ethic. I sought out the guidance of my old fencing instructors, my high school fencing coach, my mentors and coaches at the Peter Westbrook Foundation, where I had trained as a young woman before I left for Duke. Through these communities and others that I connected with, I was able to gain knowledge I needed, sometimes by building me up, other times by tearing me down at least the parts of me that were getting in the way of my advancing to the next level. One thing I learned throughout this process is that it's as important as teachers and mentors are, they are also human beings, and they have the same strengths and the same weaknesses as any of us. They can and will have other priorities as well, and at the end of the day, they cannot be a substitute for your own determination to succeed. They can only help you if you help yourself. Which brings me to discipline and resilience. A lot of people think that Olympic athletes, or any athlete at the pinnacle of success, have supernatural ability, that they are made of different stuff than the rest of us. Maybe that's true for some, but certainly not for me. I knew that I had to work harder than I ever had if I wanted to conquer the impossible. In sports, there's so much uncertainty. You have ups and you have downs, where you may, have a, where you may win a medal at one World Cup and lose your very fat first match in the next. You can find yourself having to compete injured and exhausted against an opponent who will not let up because you might not be at 100%. You can even contract food poisoning the day before one of the most important qualifying events for the Olympics. Yes. That really happened, and it was as horrible as you can imagine. Each time, you have to choose how to deal with that reality. You have to believe in the process and never allow fear to override your commitment to faith. I made the conscious decision to learn from every defeat. I started to study my opponents by learning their strengths and their weaknesses. I wrote everything down in every single competition. I would watch hours and hours of video and spend time at practice honing my technique. 
I never allowed defeat to define me. I was never afraid. By choosing happiness, every single practice and every single competition, whether I perform well or not, whether my coaches or trainers were dedicated to my success or not, whether my teammates accepted me or not, my happiness was in my own hands, and I chose to be happy. I give credit for the strength to create my own happiness to my faith and the communities in which my faith is practiced. As I qualified for my first national team, my faith had evolved and expanded to include things in life I deemed important and acceptable, even if others were less happy with my choices. I had moved beyond a childhood relationship with the law, and my faith no longer required others' interpretation or direction. I put my trust in God and allowed things to happen as they were supposed to. I never wanted things out of my control to shake me. There is a saying in my faith that what is meant for you will reach you, even if it is beneath two mountains. And what isn't meant for you won't reach you, even if it is between your two lips. This decision to approach each competition from a place of faith, while at the same time representing Team USA, reshaped my conversations with God. I stopped praying for a win or only praying during difficult times, and I started to ask Allah to allow me to represent my country, my communities, and my family well. I asked Allah to protect me from those who didn't want good for me and surround me instead with those who would encourage me and uplift me. I asked Allah to help me show patience even when the world was testing me. In return, I was not only able to pursue my dreams of competing at the highest level, I was able to explore my faith and broaden my entire definition of community far beyond what I had experienced as a child in New Jersey or even through my studies at Duke. In my sport, we traveled to 12, 10 to 12 countries each year. I reveled in the opportunities to see other cultures and in particular, meet others whose lives were very different from my own, but who shared my faith. Walking into Maracana Stadium the day of opening ceremonies at the 2016 Olympic Games, shoulder to shoulder with my fellow athletes from different parts of the United States, from different backgrounds, of varied faiths, faiths and experiences, united under the flag of red, white, and blue, was the proudest moment of my life. I realized that faith in God, the guidance of my mentors, believing in myself even when others didn't, and my resilience and commitment to my dream brought me to this moment. And without each of those things, I would not have conquered the impossible. I would not have competed at the highest level, not have moved from an unranked outsider to number seven ranked fencer in the world. Never be afraid to do what you're destined to do. I want to end by saying that if you, have ever, if you ever need an example of how faith can expand your concept of community rather than limit it, you can always look back to this celebration we are having right now. And in particular, the wonderful readings, the music, and the prayers. For you graduates, your journeys are just beginning. Your destinies await you, just as mine did, and still does. Your lives can be rich and meaningful if you continue to learn. If when you fall, you bounce back. And if you embrace, protect, and expand your communities to include those who for too long have been considered other. Much has changed between my commencement and this one. The world we are living in today is not the world I envisioned on that warm spring day in Durham 12 years ago. But, is, but it is a world that, more than ever, needs each of you to step up, learn and grow, and attempt the impossible. And I have faith you will, God willing, or as we say in Arabic, inshallah. Thank you.
What's up, y'all? <laughs> when I was five years old, my brother accidentally slammed the door on my fingers. As I fell to the floor crying, my mother's first response was not to grab gauze for the blood or ice for the swelling, but to pick me up, look me in the eyes, and say, Eden, take three deep breaths. It's all going to be OK. Just breathe. At five years old, I was livid. <laughs> what was breathing going to do? And where was this sudden omniscience coming from, mom? 18 years later, in the kind of retrospective analysis every parent hopes their child will undertake, you're welcome, mom. <laughs> I've come to realize that she was trying to teach me something. That one of the most profound ways to deal with pain is to trust in something bigger than it. Breathe and trust in the body that will heal. Breathe and trust in the mother that will guide you. Breathe and trust that tomorrow will be a different day. Stanford is many things, but it is not a refuge against pain. Maybe it was crashing in the circle of death or toiling with the imposter syndrome. Maybe it was the guilt of being safe at school while the rest of the world suffered. Maybe it was the loneliness of a mental illness, or maybe it was that final acceptance of separating from a partner you love just because it wasn't going to work out after graduation. Maybe it was the fact that sometimes it's just really difficult to hold on to joy when you feel like you have no idea what you're doing. We have all experienced pain in the last four years. But while Stanford has taught us how to view our hardships and failures as opportunities for growth, today, I want to celebrate all those moments in which we stopped, took a couple of deep breaths, and trusted in something bigger than our pain. Let us celebrate the moments your friend came over at 3 in the morning to be there for you while you cried, and you knew you were not alone. The essays and piece sets and final projects you completed because you, you believed in the strength of your own work ethic, the simple sight of a jackrabbit and Maya Green during golden hour, <laughs> reminding you that you are part of something so much bigger than yourself. And now we're here. Graduation is a type of pain of leaving the relationships we built here, of things never being the same. But in a moment, I would like all of us to close our eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, and center ourselves in something we trust in. It can be in your relationships, in the strength of your faith, or in the self. All of you should be so proud to be. Ready? Let us close our eyes, center ourselves, and take one deep. forever trust in the blossoming of your lives. Thank you.
class of 2019, we give you our blessings. May you have the courage to live a life that you will love. May you live this day and those to come compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And may this day and every day a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. May God bless you and keep you now and in the days to come. Amen.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.